billions of years ago, life on Earth emerged from non-living matter. Conditions at that time were unique and never to occur again. From these ancient beginnings evolved the spectacular diversity of living things that today cover the planet. Field museum biologists seek to understand why there is diversity among living things and how this diversity evolved. Venezuela's rich biodiversity makes it an important country for evolutionary research and conservation biology. Dr. Scott Lanyon, curator of birds, and Venezuelan biologist Gonzalo Morales investigate the relationship between birds and their habitat in the cloud forests of the Caribbean coast. Dr. Barry Chernoff, curator of fishes, collaborates with Dr. Antonio Machado to discover and identify new species of fish in the black water systems of central Venezuela. Venezuela is a particularly important place for me to do my research because there are so many different types of habitats and environments. For example, I'm very interested in how are the habitat differences, the different types of environments, how has that contributed to the formation of different species? And why that change in their body forms, whether they're slender or deep-bodied, is important in the mechanism for how evolution produced these species. There may be as many fishes that live in the fresh waters of South America as there are birds in the world. And that's an important phenomenon. What led to the production of that many species? As a curator at Field Museum, it's an integral part of my job to describe the diversity of the planet and to start to understand the rules of evolution. How did this all come to be? We can study in Illinois. We can study in the area that, we, uh, that the Field Museum is situated. And that gives us one piece of the puzzle. It gives us one view of the natural world. But that's not enough. You really need to sample all of life. And to come down to the tropics is an excellent opportunity from an ornithologist perspective, someone who's studying birds, to look at a very different situation extremely diverse in terms of its birds, its avifauna, that gives us some other clues as to how evolution works. This falls is really important because it separates the lower Cowra River from the middle Cowra River. And falls such as this one are a potential mechanism in the formation of new species. If there are fishes down below, these falls prevent those fishes from getting up above. And given enough time, they may form new species. Down here in the tropics, the biodiversity is a lot greater. For example, there are very few species of fish that live in the Great Lakes, maybe 30 species that only live in the Great Lakes. But of course, there was a glacier there 10,000 years ago, and there were no Great Lakes. Where these regions down here were not affected in the same way by the, the global changes in climate that occurred during the history of the Earth as the Earth was changing, as continents were moving. The fishes, in some ways, are the storytellers. And we're the people who have to ask the right questions with our scientific methods to pull out this important history. It was the organisms fishes and plants and insects that led biologists and geologists to hypothesize that continents were drifting apart. It was the evidence from the organisms that led to that important conclusion long before we had the technology to test those theories 
so what we are doing is trying to use the organisms in our case using the fishes to, to have them tell us the story about what went on The particular forest we're standing in right now uh, might be referred to as a cloud forest, meaning that you have clouds come through throughout the day, really. Sometimes they'll actually be dropping rain, but all of the time they will be depositing a fair amount of moisture through the trees because the clouds are actually rolling right through the forest. This results in many habitats that are unique to a forest such as this, and birds have evolved to use just those particular things. This is a place, situated as it is along the coast of Venezuela, which receives large numbers of our North American migrants. Some of our warblers, we have some of our blackbirds come through here. It's here that these birds spend fully half of their life. As biologists centered in North America, we have had a bias often to studying birds only in North America and believing that that is sufficient to understand their entire life. Whereas in fact, one needs to come to a place like this and understand exactly how they interact with their environment for the rest of the year during our winter. I can wander through the forest, I can listen to the vocalizations and that will give me at least a portion of an understanding of what's living in the area. But there are still many species that are rather cryptic, that are hard to see, for that, we employ another technique, and that's putting up nets, uh, something called mist nets. These are strung out through the forest, and I look for places that have dense vegetation. The nets in shade, so the birds won't have an opportunity to see it, but the birds are flying through the foliage and don't have an opportunity to see the net until they're right on top of it. Another place one might put it is actually a place much like where we're standing, where you're at the top of a ridge where birds come up over the ridge to get from one side to another. This is an excellent place, for example, to look for migrant birds as they're migrating off of the Caribbean into continental South America. Yeah, we have. Oh. It's a joint effort to conserve the biodiversity. And I'm here with Dr. Antonio Machado of the Universidad Central de Venezuela. Antonio has invited me to, to come and work down here with him because we've been collaborating for almost 10 years now in studies of Venezuelan and South American fishes. And we've been invited by the National Park Service of Venezuela to prepare a list of the fishes that live here in order to aid in conservation efforts within the national park. Antonio and his group bring in certain talents and I bring in other types of talents and it's the melding of those talents that can provide the difference in understanding the biodiversity and bringing its meaning to public attention. Biodiversity is like a stack of cans. Every time we pull a can out, it's possible that the, the balance of the system and the stability of the system doesn't change. But if we pull out a can from the bottom of the stack, all the system goes to fall. So which species are important to maintain the balance of the stack? The only way to answer that question is to study the system as a whole and find out what is the position of each species in the system and maintain the species that are really important in the system. Scattered across southeastern Venezuela are huge sandstone mesas called tapuis. Their cliffs rise thousands of feet out of the forest. They are among the oldest exposed rocks on the face of the earth. Life on the top has been isolated from the forest below for thousands of years. This isolation has evolved unique plants and animals making the Tapuis excellent study areas for evolutionary research. 
and a priority for conservation. Ayuan Tupui is over 3,000 feet high. It supports the world's tallest waterfall, Angel Falls. The cascade breaks into a mist halfway down the Tupui and hits the base as a pounding ring. Set aside as a national park, the Tupui's fragile environment and unique species offer new insights into the process of evolution. We've been set a task, and that's to build a jigsaw puzzle. The pieces are the species. And the first step of a biologist is to go out and to discover species and to name species. That's the act of turning over the pieces, revealing their existence. Long before you actually turn over all the pieces, you start to see patterns and begin to describe the patterns that you observe in nature. The problem, of course, in trying to do this puzzle is that as we're out there turning over these pieces and discovering them, there are other forces at work that are burning those pieces. And that greatly hinders our ability to truly understand life on this planet. For every piece, every species, holds some clue, small piece of the puzzle, small clue as to how this all has come to be. You can't conserve organisms that you don't know exist. You must be able to have identified them, be able to put names to them, to know that they're there. Beyond that, you must also have some understanding of how they plug into the, the, this very complex environment if we're talking about saving a tropical forest. It's a very highly interrelated network of organisms. If you don't understand the complexity of their life history patterns, how they interrelate, it is very difficult to devise a reasonable management strategy. The Rio Caura still has much virgin forest and the water is not polluted and it's in very clean, clear condition with a lot of species living here. And it's important that we get to these places before logging takes place or before the forest is removed because of the integral nature of the forest and the fishes. The rivers come into the forests and many of the fishes eat the seeds of the plants and the trees actually depend upon the fishes in order to pass those seeds through their guts for the seeds to germinate properly. So it's an important ecological story. It's an important conservation issue. We have to have a common goal. That is, preserve some areas for the future. We have to obtain medicine that comes from these forests. We have to obtain fish that can be food for people. The different ethnic groups that live in these rivers, it's called Makiritare. Makiritare means people that live from the river. So it's really important to maintain the water quality of this river because there is a lot of people that depend upon these rivers. Conservation is one of the most important problems facing society today. It's a complicated task in part because it has to be a collaborative effort if we're going to successfully conserve biodiversity. The collaboration is the key. Not only is it a logical thing to do, but in terms of doing this quickly, and that's what conservation is going to require, simply because of extinction is going on at a very rapid rate. We need to mobilize the scientists to work well with the conservation organizations to present a reasonable plan of action to governments around the world. We bring back to the Field Museum not only the information that we gather out here in the field, but also the knowledge from our collaborations and what we learn about people and societies. And so 
even though we're working far from Chicago, I believe this has important consequences for it because it's a way for Chicago and the students who study there to learn firsthand from the people who are out here what it is about the biodiversity that's important. What are the questions that we're asking? And this type of interaction, I believe, makes the Field Museum a place where cultures are meeting and people are exchanging ideas and figuring out a better way to approach the problems that we're all facing.